So yeah, everything actually hinges on the second half of this race, which makes the first half completely pointless. Game design. Why even bother with the first half race? I don't know. It's very weird. To be fair, they're not going to do it again. It's just like, I, it's just a weird artifact of how this system wound up working and how they decided to, to split the race in half. Like I said, uh, Emily waits in the middle, and like technically so do you, so... I mean, I guess it would be kind of weird if they didn't race the first half, or like if they, if that was all just static, like I don't know. It's one of these very weird game design slash narrative problems. But you did say that, uh, that Trani always beats you to the first half, right? Yep. Okay. And he always loses on the second half. I think that's my problem more than anything. It's like because now you're now you're betraying the other promise you made, which is that if you've introduced the ability to beat your friends in this race, now you're going. Oh, okay. Well, no, 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 no. Not in that one. That one doesn't count. It's real weird. Like I've I've gone on record complaining about. I don't think the dungeon races were a great idea in a kind of a weird roundabout way. Like, I love the fact that, you know, you're notionally racing your friend through this dungeon and you can beat her. Except I just think it's a... It's a very weird thing to be racing somebody through this kind of dungeon, in this kind of game. Like, it's just a weird thing to have on the back of your mind when you're playing it. Oh, I don't even mean that. I mean, I do think it's a dull and bad idea in the sense that it does not really work in the context of a big puzzle-heavy dungeon. I just also mm. think completely independently that it is extremely stupid of them to do the whole, okay, you can do it, you can race this, you can race them, and if you're really good, you can win. And then this time, just this time, they're like, ah, okay, maybe not this one. This one was just, this one was just pretend. Yeah. I don't know. Anyway, we've got bubbles again, but now we have the cold element. So now we can do a new and exciting thing with the bubbles. And it's very important that we remember that the bubbles float until you hit them with ice. Right, I, I cannot overstate the importance of that. Also, here's a fun new enemy. These guys are fuckers. They have a lot of fire. They do a lot of fire attacks. You can put the fire out by inflicting chill on them. That's nice. But uh, that doesn't make them any less uh, dangerous. Also, I keep trying to demonstrate Frozen Star and I keep regretting it, but like, what What do you expect me to do? Not try and show off? Here it is. That's a pretty big number. I approve. Yep, it's not bad for one hit for one SP. And I'm sure I don't need to tell you that it's going to have upgraded versions. I'm sure I also don't need to tell you that it can crit by the way, yes, I did actually die here. I just thought it was real important to show off what happens when you try and rely too much on high-risk techs. So naturally I'm going to keep doing it, I'm just, you know, actually going to win this time. So is this guy the new Claptrap? Are we going to be seeing a bunch of him in this half of the dungeon? I mean, a bunch? Not really. Definitely more than one, but he's, he's not nearly as ubiquitous as Claptrap was in Temple Mine. Oh yeah, by the way, we do have other ice techs, other than Frozen Star. 
I mean, I forget that sometimes because I like Frozen Star a whole lot, but... Snowflock and Indigo Strike aren't massive damage dealers, but they make a lot of ice appear, they can do a lot of status inflection, and they hit really big areas, so, um, you know. It looks more like a zone control thing than, than a damage thing. Yeah. So yeah, ice puts out fire. Don't ask. You'd think that, like, just impacting the fire with a bubble would put it out, but no. It has to be ice. And for whatever reason, these bits of fire only stay out for like a tiny amount of time, but... So yeah, remember that thing when this game introduces elements with like a million different nuances and then makes you slowly appreciate how many of those nuances they are and how to control them? This is basically that again. Here's the big door. We're going to be coming back here, obviously, but um, I figured this was a branching path, but actually it wasn't. This one is, it's, we're going to go pretty much the entire length of the dungeon before I check out the southward facing doors on this floor. There might actually be a reason for that. Here's a room that I fucking hate. It's got a lot of shots that you have to do. I haven't... There's, there's a couple of these that I haven't even really figured out. It's just... There's a whole lot of water and a whole lot of ice. And a whole lot of requirements. And naturally, if you mess this one up, you have to, you know, go the whole way back and go do all of these again. It kind of sucks. Also, um, maybe you forget sometimes, but these ice blocks are actually ice. They have ice physics on them. So better hope you don't slip. It's a very good time. Excuse me, I'm, I'm just gonna break out these things a fourth fucking time, and we're gonna do this again. I was so sure we were done with ice physics. So right, wonder how ice interacts with these guys. Oh, okay. So it turns out that hitting these guys with a charged ice shot just instantly breaks them. That? And it does an absolute crap ton of damage. That would check out. Bugs are not exactly known for their love of the cold. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's kind of amusing that these guys have um, crippling vulnerabilities to both fire and ice. But there you go. This must be that game design thing where they increase your capabilities and make you feel more powerful. Anyway, this is the second half of the dungeon, and you may have noticed the disparity in length between uh, this video and the previous one. We mentioned the part time before. You might recall that uh, we kind of offhandedly mentioned that the part time for beating Emily through the first half is uh, 60 minutes, and the part time for beating her through the second half is 50 minutes. You might think that this means that the second half is somehow breezier, snappier, in some way uh, tamer than the first half. You would be wrong. This is the point where the gloves come the whole way off. And yeah, it once again took me a little bit to notice. Yep, yeah, 
curved walls. You've got to watch those diagonals. Puzzle gloves are very definitely off right now. Like... Oh, lord. Hmm. Well, I already hate this. Now, this once again looks a lot worse than it is. There's a couple switches here. Yeah, I, I see exactly what this is. Yeah. I just, I, I just hate it instinctually. Yeah. So the first three switches, you only need to hit once ever, and that's it. They're, they're solved. The thing that's kind of a fucker is that you need to hit these two switches simultaneously. So you have to do a little bit of rooting in order to get these things going in exactly the right order and with the right timing. Fortunately, this is pretty much the only puzzle of this kind in the dungeon. I mean, there's going to be other things that involve pipes and timing, but nothing like that. Also, yeah, um, gotta remember, the elevation difference matters. Those rocks floating in lava when you dump ice into them are half an elevation lower than we are right now. You know, I gotta say, I'm a big fan of the, uh, whoever got to name this part of the dungeon, because Big Fire Room is definitely, uh... Hmm. I can't say they're wrong. Yeah. There are, there are some treats in this game for people who like paying attention to the names of rooms. It's actually not a default option in this game to have the name pop up when you enter a room. Normally, if you use default settings, you only ever see them when you look at the map or uh, when you open the quick menu. But I actually turned that on for the LP because I thought that somebody at some point was probably going to appreciate room names. It might as well have been you. Here's me living very dangerously. Well, no, we are we are presently on fire. Uh, well, the only hit point that matters is the last one. So hey, now we can open silver chests. I still don't really like this whole conceit, but yeah, what are you going to do? This puzzle is mean. I was going to say, I don't even see what we're s oh, oh, okay. I, was like, I don't even understand what you're supposed to actually be doing here, but yeah, okay, sure, that was a shot. I mean, the shots aren't even that complicated, it's just, like, connecting the one thing with the other thing and realising that, yeah, we're doing this. This room is exactly the same. Nothing that we actually need to do here is particularly complicated. Although you'll be forgiven for not immediately noticing that there are two junctions in this pipe network that we're changing when we flip to the fire mode there. But this is really a very straightforward matter of just noticing what these things do and pretty much just figuring out a series of actions to do to solve them. Like, this thing looks like it's some like gigantic, bizarre, overcomplicated reflex test, but these are puzzles. It wasn't bad. So much in this game comes down to it's a puzzle. So here's a new kind of moth. I gotta say, I dig the laser. That's uh. Yes. That's a good. That's a good option to try and get on your moth when you go to upgrade models. Oh yes. The lasers are great. Um, they're they're nice and dangerous. They'll set you on fire. They hit a big area pretty quickly. 
The specific deal with these moths that are actually fighting them, rather than, you know, just being the same as the other ones but with a laser, is that they will always dodge your shots, except for uh, a good while after and a very short while before they fire the laser. So the standard approach is to dodge the laser and then try and hit them. The pro approach is of course to cross counter them as they are firing the laser. It feels very good to do. I was very sure that skimming this ice block over the top of those water blocks would work, but eh, we got a brief reason. Lame. It's a little disappointing. This one, on the other hand, is very fun. I like that one. It's very satisfying to do. A lot of the stuff in this game is kind of... it toes that line. Well, it really rides on... It relies on that, that rush when you solve a puzzle, and it, that feels good. I mean, technically all puzzle games rely on that, but like... This game does this thing with setting up these complicated gambits with all these moving parts. On the assumption that... It's not just figuring out the solution that will feel good, but also actually doing the steps will just be satisfying, even after you've got the hey I figured it out buzz. It's a balance and I think this game just about manages it. Your mileage may of course vary. I'm primed not to like this room because of the elevation angle, but like, it's actually pretty easy to spot because all of the actual uh, symbols, all of the actual bubbles with the arrows on them are all at the same elevation. It's pretty inoffensive. Now you might think that this is just the same puzzle again, and you're basically right, but what if we did it again with fire? Always be on the lookout for suspicious dots on the floor. It usually pays off. Hidden treasure in dungeons tends to be really good. Like, look at this damn thing. That's pretty solid. It's real nice. It's a good piece of equipment. It's uh, actually tied for level with the with the dried grass hat, but uh, it's a lot better. say, Emily, I don't think that moths are particularly, uh, vulnerable to ice cream? That's a, that's a new one. I mean, I, I imagine if you managed to hit one with ice cream, it would probably, you know, not survive for various reasons. But I feel like that might just be kind of incidental to the whole, you know, being hit with anything. I don't know. In any case, Emily asks why laser moths, and I, th I don't know, I think that's kind of self-evident why laser moths. You know, I'm going to agree with that statement. 
Laser moths? How could we not? Much like the shark that is also a skeleton, the laser moth does not need an explanation or a lore reason to exist. And yet... Oh, I'm sure it won't stop them from attempting to give it one. I'm just saying it, it doesn't need one. Mm -hmm. It is self-evident. Oh, yeah. Anyway, we had our first glimpse of the final puzzle room. But uh, we're going to need some more keys before we can uh, properly get to grips with that one. First, though, let's fight a couple of these guys with ice for the first time. I'm sure you'll be shocked to know that ice is pretty uniformly effective against Maroon Valley enemies. And right, the the ice effect left behind by Snowflork and Indigo Strike, it actually damages enemies when they run into it. So even if you miss, you still you're still laying down some pretty good combat utility. Try to be cheeky there and regretted it immediately. I will never learn. You know, I wouldn't expect you to, because I would also be constantly trying to do the big number attack, even when it is blatantly obvious that you really shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. The real important thing about it is that like, you're vulnerable for the whole casting time, and anything that you do that interrupts it will, will just like it will just stop. If you take damage, if you move, if you try and dash, if you try and guard, if you take any damage, except in, I think, in a handful of circumstances, that thing's not going off. You lost it. Sorry. Should have paid more attention. This room is called the Test of Surprise, and I'm still not really sure what the surprise is. The, is, is the surprise jellyfish? I don't know, it's not really very much of a surprise. Nor, I think, should be the fact that ice attacks pretty good against a jellyfish. The lava in this room is a little bit of a pain, but not for the reason that you might expect. The problem with it is that if you stun one of these moths and they fall into the lava, it actually resets their break. Like, see? They just get right back up. Of course, we can push them right back down then, and you know, fall to literally five hit points doing it, but still it's a kind of a thing. Now at this point I'm thinking, right, four keys, probably good, right? Nope. We're still missing one, so time to break out the map. And once you understand that this whole dungeon is made of square floors, it's pretty easy to see what the deal is. Honestly, the confusing part specifically about Fadro Temple is that uh, there's a lot of moving between floors, and there's a whole... There's a couple of rooms that are actually only accessible from the floor above. So it's not quite the, the free roam that it seems like it should be. And yeah, here's that hourglass profile again. Kinda got some, uh... Some Tower of Hera vibes going on here. Specifically the one from Link Between Worlds, but... We're drawing from all over. But yeah, the thing that's kind of a mess about this, about finding this room in particular, is that it's only accessible from the floor above. And you wouldn't know that if you're looking at a map of the floor that it's on, unless you realise that this whole place is pretty broadly symmetrical. So here's a nice fun one. It seems like we've got to make this shot from up here, but actually... You might observe that when you're not standing on the switch, this whole thing just goes around in a circle. So you can solve it at your leisure. Let's 
second half is pretty much the same thing again, except there's a slightly more irritating shot to make to actually get the ice cube in the oven. Plus, one other thing, which is that we actually are on a timer on this one. You have to do this at exactly the second available opportunity. I was going to say, how much leeway do you actually have as far as the simultaneous input? I'm not actually sure, but it's not really relevant. The point is, you get you get two loops. You have to let it pass the first time, and you have to let it hit the second time. It's not actually possible to get it in any other order. Timing doesn't really come into it, other than actually hitting the second loop. Like all games that do this kind of thing, most of the work that goes into designing these puzzles is basically just about managing the number of options that you have, and making sure that we have discrete and not continuous variants between options. Also, surprise, I bet you thought this was going to be all jellyfish. You know, in a way I'm kind of glad it wasn't, because the jellyfish with ice look... Yeah, not really very much of a thing. Anyway, it's a very good opportunity to get a lot of uh, very big exploding techs out. I'm a fan of it. Here's that last key. From here on out, it's just a matter of actually remembering how to get back up. So here's kind of a weird thing, right? We had to unlock these five blocks in order to do this. But then when we unlock all of those blocks, all of this stuff just appears. It's not like the room is solvable while any of those things are locked. Okay. So yeah, time for our big climactic capstone puzzle. This one, once again, looks a lot worse than it actually is. The real important part is that we get a special block that puts our shot in slow mode. As for the rest of this stuff, it's pretty much just... These things are pretty much just gates. A little bit of cursory remembering to figure out how to actually unlock each one. And the rest of this is, like, it's pretty routine, really. But watch out for that other block, because that one speeds your shot back up again. And that's pretty much it. That's, that's all the mystery here. This room is not really very much of a thing. I, you'll note that I haven't cut any of this. I literally walked into this room. You've seen attempt number one and two. This was attempt number three. And it just falls into place. Yeah, that looked a lot scarier than it actually is. Speaking of looking scary... Do you like fighting moths? I mean, they look kind of obnoxious, but not particularly difficult, so... Shrug? Well, I really hope that you do enjoy fighting moths, because, well, there are some moths in this room. I see that. I kind of love this, actually. It's... it's just a gigantic clusterfuck. It's fast and, and frantic, and there's just stuff happening everywhere. You're just breaking these things left and right. There's just bullets and lasers flying around. It's carnage. I absolutely love it. Not gonna lie, 
kind of disappointed there aren't more laser balls in this in this section. Oh, you'll notice the counter on the floor is still blinking. The light is still young. Yeah, but I mean, we saw the wall. We we if you even though you don't know, like you do know what you're in. For. I don't know. I think there's a. I think there's an extent to which um, having more laser mobs would be a tiny bit obnoxious. Like they are actually kind of dangerous. Mostly, the deal with them is that they're there to make you always have to be second guessing whether or not you want to be um, attacking or counter attacking. Because you've got to do very different things to deal with both of these. Anyway, you want more laser moths? Okay, fine. Here's three laser moths at once. Are you happy? Yes, actually. Oh, good. I'm glad this game was able to make you happy. What a good room. And that's it. That's Fadro Temple. Except, of course, for the small matter of, um, well, this whole thing. I don't understand why they made the platform rise out of the floor, but, eh, whatever. I definitely see what it, what they meant when they said that this, uh, this area is, it has about the same amount of puzzles, it's just a lot denser. So, you wanted more laser morph content? You just had to go and say it, didn't you? I live for laser morph content right now. Mm hmm. Well, here's a really big morph with a really big fucking laser. There is exactly one hole in the middle of this platform, and that's pretty much all you get to shoot him with. Then he comes down on the floor, he's vulnerable. He's weak to ice. Like, do, do you even have to ask? As usual, the first phrase here is pretty much just a tutorial. He's got a couple basic attacks that he does basic iterations of. He's only firing one flame tornado. He's only firing one laser. He wasn't even doing this attack in the first phase. And phases 2 and 3 are where the actual fight begins. You'll notice that I'm kind of garbage at dodging this. Like, I'm, I'm going to be trying to get a lot better about dodging as we go on, but... Hey, uh, I'll always have guards there, right? In the second phase, he starts doing this bullshit when you break him. So, hope you remember how to use bubbles. And I tried, I really tried, to do the skip here, but uh, I just wasn't remembering the timings. You can absolutely do this with Frozen Star. If you manage to get in most of his health in the second health bar, all the way down, and hit him with a good Frozen Star, and maybe get just a tiny bit lucky, you can straight up skip the third phase of this fight. I mean, the third phase doesn't seem much harder than the second one, which it... I mean, he does the same stuff, he just does more of it in a row, like, he does this three times in a row now. Right. Like, this boss, like, uniformly, seems way easier than, than the giant flat trap. Hmm. Maybe it actually is. I'm not really sure. I mean, not just because you have way better damage options, but because the giant claptrap required you to get really good at hitting him with, what, four, five bombs in a row? Mm-hmm. Whereas this is just, that eh, you know, as long as you're even remotely quick about hitting him with ice and knocking him down, you just, the attacks are easy. Mm -hmm. they, yeah. Well, okay, I say easy, not having direct first-hand knowledge. Easier. But they do not look difficult to dodge. Mm-hmm. 
Anyway, I was looking at my I was looking at my time when I was doing this, and the OBS counter said 54 minutes, and I was like, well, crap, I guess I'm retrying this. But it turns out that when you retry a boss, which I did a couple times, it actually refunds your time. So my final time came out to something like 49 and a half minutes. Poor Emily. That's right, Trani, it's time to collect the reward. Everybody's favorite thing, capital L lore, baby. I mean, there is that. But this one does actually have something else for us. Lore comes first, though. So yeah, here we go. This is what we're really here for. We just doubled our amount of skill points. So now we can bank up to 8, and our resting SP total has increased to 2. That's pretty good. So yeah, we've gone about as far west as we can get. So for our next uh, excursion across the overworld, we're going to go east out of Rookie Harbour. And instead of going into Autumn's Rise, we're going into Autumn's Fall. A place that seems to have been named with the express purpose of causing small arguments between Brits and Americans. I guess they still haven't resolved that in the year 3000 whatever the hell this is. I cannot believe that our friends in the Nerd Guild saw this lore and were like, no no no, I wanna go I wanna go see the sites first. Like, frankly, I don't think they deserve to be in the Nerd Guild anymore. What's the draw of looking at stuff when you could be reading instead? That said, Enel has some pretty decent stuff going on. Like, she just wanted to burn things. Who can't relate to that? There's a lot of decent spins on creation myths, but I will never get tired of the gods were bored. Yeah, same. I don't think anyone likes the jellyfish even after you get the cold element. Honestly, they almost seemed easier to fight with the fire instead of the ice. Yeah. Like, with the, with the ice, you can just shoot them as the thing. You can just pelt them with a bunch of shots and reduce their hit points to zero. You don't have to do any crap with getting double hits on bubbles. Yeah, we absolutely got this one. 
We're missing two and they're pretty much both just things that I noticed and I was like, well, I could get these, but we're doing a race. Except that, you know, actually don't tell anyone, but they were both in the first half of the dungeon, so I absolutely could have probably got them. We had like half an hour to spare on that one. But it's the principle of the thing, you know? And you see that village in the distance? You can go there. Video games, man. You know, Todd Howard would absolutely adore this game, wouldn't he? Like, Todd Howard would be like- I don't know, I, I, I think it works a bit too well I for mean, him. I'm, I'm just saying that Todd Howard would absolutely be a Cross Worlds fan. Absolutely would. Okay, fine, let's go hang out with our friends. Ah, yes. What a great view, the giant slab of brown that we're being shown. Uh, writers are taking the piss a tiny bit. Yeah, uh, Emily? Well, I'm glad that inevitability finally resolved itself. I don't know how much longer we could have kept that going. Yeah, that, that could have gone a lot worse. I, I don't know, Sergei. I, I absolutely can believe that Emily managed to stay oblivious. Yeah, let's just be done with this day. I choose to believe that was Leia telling Sergei, like, no. No, I'm done talking to you. I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> 